Welcome to South Africa, um, to our guests from other countries. It's very important to us as South Africans that you are joining us at a time when we are discussing this phenomenon called state capture. And the looting of the public assets of the South African people. We are at a moment in our history when we are debating what this means, what are its patterns, what can we do, how can we follow the money. So the panel um, that we have um, comes at a very good time and um, I'm, I'm joined by a, a, a grouping of experts who really have been tracking and documenting the global theft of the commons. My name is Tandega Gubule. I'm the economics editor at the SABC. I'm responsible for economics and business and financial markets coverage across radio, TV, and digital. Recently, because of the plunder of the SABC and the repurposing of the institution to serve the interests of a narrow elite, I became involved in the struggle for an independent public broadcaster and freedom of expression. Around the world, it is estimated that about one trillion US dollars flows illegally out of, the developing and, out of developing and emerging markets annually, and these are the proceeds of crime, corruption, and tax evasion. More than is received in aid. And to track this and to discuss this, I have the, I think, the best panel I could possibly have. I felt a bit intimidated reading through the CVs. And um, I really look forward to, the, to this discussion. We will start off with James Mintz. James has been an adjunct professor at the um, Stable, stable Center of um, Investigative Journalism at the Columbia School of Journalism for the past 10 years. And he has um, conducted research and investigations, and um, he has what I believe is an extensive presentation on the phenomenon that we are discussing here this morning. James. Good morning. I wanted to uh, show you a sort of visualization of um, how uh, dirty money uh, gets hidden and, um, and how some tips on how we can trace it. I, um, my, my investigator firm did a sort of study of the notorious kleptocrats all over the world. Kleptocracy, as you know, is rule by thieves. So I think that's a good uh, definition for us to, to have today. And, um, and we found some real patterns that held true across the whole world in how corrupt officials uh, uh, hide dirty money uh, and, um, and also in how investigators of various kinds, investigative reporters, prosecutors, police, uh, et cetera, have traced that money, have succeeded at tracing it. And, uh, and I thought I would start by showing you the hiding patterns, and then I'll show you uh, some tracing patterns. Um, there are, um, well, I'm going to show you sort of um, uh, six steps in this process, a sort of a, a playing field for dirty money. Um, that we found in these uh, cases, we found in these patterns. Um, but before I start, I thought I would uh, give you a sort of a, uh, a bottom line on, on what we found. Um, and that is that um, the moves and tricks that corrupt officials use in hiding <coughs> dirty money, each of these moves and tricks contain the seeds of their own destruction. That is that they have uh, opportunities for us to, to trace the money. Um, I should say that um, 
uh, yeah. So let me let me start with my my pattern. I've I've put up the the six steps here. I'll just say them uh, quickly. The the pattern begins with the corrupt official taking money under the table. Uh, then they create a financial structure to hide it. So take and hide. Then they move the money into the structure. That's the third step. Then they network with family members and associates and lawyers to, uh, to run the sort of dirty money operation. Every one, every kleptocrat we studied did not do the structuring and hiding themselves. They had, they had help. Um, then they cover up their tracks, uh, step five. And then since it's no, it's no fun for dirty money to, to just sit in a structure gathering dust, they bring the money out and enjoy it. So with that, let me uh, uh, take you to the first step. Uh, again, as I said, I'm going to do the hiding first and then the tracing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in, um, in this first step, uh, taking the dirty money, we found these are the, the four ways that uh, corrupt officials uh, uh, take money under the table. This isn't really our purpose today. We're really talking about hiding the money, so I'll go quickly. Um, taking some bribe to choose one bidder over the others, um, uh, sort of steering a contract to the party that has bribed the official. Uh, taking <clears throat> a kickback uh, under the table for some other government affair, uh, some government favor. Third, uh, 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 finding a way to insert uh, uh, themselves between uh, somebody selling something to the government and the government itself, uh, and then taking some kind of markup. And fourth, uh, giving protection to criminals and the criminals uh, expressing their gratitude with a payoff. That's, uh, those are the most common ways we found corrupt officials taking dirty money. Now we move into the hiding. Um, and just to really uh, oversimplify things, uh, uh, we find uh, shell companies and bank accounts. Um, and this is, in a sense, the essence of structuring. Uh, so in my example on the left, uh, creating an entity, um, the, uh, so the example I use is your offshore shell company acts as the middleman structure in a government procurement earning you a fat commission and the company isn't traceable to you. So for example, uh, in the United States we had the former head of Donald Trump's political campaign, Paul Manafort, indicted recently and he had created uh, several dozen shell companies in uh, Cyprus and elsewhere and had um, dozens of bank accounts uh, that were uh, moving money around, uh, just as a, as a quick example. Um, and then there are several ways to move money around within the structure. Some of these are within the banking system uh, and some of these are involve art and jewelry, and of course, cash. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but uh, with my example on the left uh, here, uh, uh, often there are uh, a number of bank accounts and <clears throat> wire transfers among them that seem confusing to investigators, but are actually part of the structure. Um, in my example here, uh, money is being wired from banker one to banker two, and banker two has <clears throat> instructions to automatically rewire the money to a, a very hidden place. So sometimes there are, are bank accounts at the edge of the structure uh, that receive the money, uh, and then, and then, and then uh, what I call automatic rewiring to, uh, to, a, to an even deeper hole uh, in Liechtenstein or somewhere that is uh, uh, almost untraceable. Um, the fourth step in this pattern we found is networking among uh, family and friends. 
I've used uh, a, a daughter here, a 16-year-old daughter, as an example. Uh, we find uh, many, many cases, as I'm sure you do, where even minor, uh, even young children, uh, even babies we have found, uh, assets are put in the names of, uh, of, um, of relatives, uh, uh, no matter what age. Um, and, then, um, and then you can see, uh, uh, in a moment, I'm going to advise you to not just, when you're looking for assets, not just look in the name of the corrupt official, but uh, to look in the name of their family members. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, associates of various kinds get involved, and, and, then, uh, and those include uh, uh, many, many lawyers. Uh, we, when we began to do this study, we thought we would find many accountants helping uh, corrupt officials hide money. We found almost none. Uh, what we found was layer upon layer of lawyers. Um, and you can have your own theories about that. Perhaps people feel protected by the privilege, legal privilege and confidentiality of lawyers. But for whatever reason, uh, 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 lawyers in uh, places like London and New York, places in the home country of the corrupt official, lawyers in places like Panama and the offshore jurisdictions, layer upon layer of lawyers. And then as far as uh, associates go, we found real patterns in the types of associates uh, that often become involved in hiding dirty money. For example, we found over and over again that local travel agents in the, uh, in the uh, hometown of the corrupt official uh, would be enlisted to help hide dirty money. I don't know why that is. Uh, uh, I think Qaddafi is an example. Uh, maybe if you're Qaddafi and you're thinking about who could help you uh, connect to Swiss bankers or whatever, perhaps the lady in your hometown who has always been moving you around the world uh, might be good at, at moving your money around the world. But in any case, um, uh, lawyers and travel agents are, uh, are a real pattern. Um, and then uh, it turns out that the, uh, that the dirty money game is a real cat and mouse game. Uh, that is that as investigators, reporters, uh, prosecutors, <coughs> um, et cetera, begin to close in on corrupt officials, uh, there, there are efforts made to, to cover up uh, what they've done. Uh, the examples here are just the most simple of them. Uh, uh, transferring real estate to others uh, so that they're uh, not in the original name, uh, and those are often transferred for a dollar. Uh, there has to be some consideration when an asset is transferred, but it can be you know, as low as a dollar. Um, we found many uh, uh, assets uh, uh, in code names and fake names and, um, and even um, these law firms that specialize in structuring uh, sometimes offer a very special service um, of putting uh, the corrupt officials' assets in their own names, that is, the names of the lawyers. Imagine what they charge for that. Uh, putting their own neck on the line uh, as a stand-in, as a front for the client. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the uh, services offered by that Panamanian law firm in the center of the Panama Papers, I believe that was their most expensive offering on their menu. Uh, and of course, intimidation uh, of, you know, against witnesses or others who were involved. I guess uh, one point you're hearing behind all of this pattern is that, that uh, the hiding of dirty money is a, uh, is a group affair. It, is a, you know, it, it, it takes, uh, even though it's a secret uh, project, uh, there are many people involved in it some around the edges, such as trustees and fiduciaries and even secretaries from an accounting firm or a law firm who were enlisted to put their names on the papers and so on. Uh, and sometimes as um, investigations catch up with this, with this uh, intimidation or bribes or whatever to keep those witnesses in line uh, are required.
And then, as I said, um, uh, uh, the whole point is to enjoy this money for the corrupt official. Um, and, and the patterns include, uh, as you know, real estate comes up a great deal. Uh, real estate uh, mansions and, and uh, fabulous places, both in the home country of the corrupt official and in uh, popular destinations like the south of France and uh, houses in London and apartments in New York and so on. And uh, back to my main point, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but uh, the, my, my point being that each of these moves contains the seeds of their own destruction and opportunities for investigators to, uh, uh, to get to the bottom of these things. Real estate is very difficult to own through a structure. And yet that's exactly what corrupt officials want to do over and over again. Sometimes a multiple uh, company uh, structure so that uh, the real estate is sitting in London, uh, the, uh, the phone bill or the utility bill or the payment for the butler has to come out of a shell company in the Caymans or the guy in Switzerland is supposed to take care of that, but they don't, so it sits on the desk at the Caymans and suddenly the lights go off uh, because the bill hasn't been paid or the butler is angry and, and starting to tell tales because he hasn't been paid. These are actual cases over and over again that we found. Uh, the, um, just as one example, the, uh, the son of the dictator of Equatorial Guinea, Obion, uh, just his structure neglected to pay the staff at the mansion in Malibu and these uh, 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 house uh, employees had to go to court in Malibu to in California to get paid and that was the beginning I believe of the unraveling of his structure so uh, seeds of their own destruction they want real estate but it's very very difficult to do through structuring uh, uh, of course, vehicles, uh, uh, planes, and boats, and cars, again, those are relatively easy to trace. Uh, there are people around the world who keep track of, of plane numbers and watch uh, the private planes of, of, uh, of corrupt officials going in and out of Geneva and so on, and putting them online. The same with other uh, indicia of unexplained wealth, like expensive watches. As you know, there are citizens around the world who have come to to watch to keep an eye on the watches that are owned by corrupt officials and to calculate oh my my gosh he's wearing a, a watch that's 10 times his annual salary um, again seeds of their of their own destruction um, so I've quickly taken you through these six steps but let's turn now to tracing and there are three points in this six point in this six-step process that I think are particularly vulnerable uh, to investigators. Uh, the, the point at which they hide or structure their money, the point at which they network with others, and the point at which they take the money out to enjoy it. Uh, so let's start with hiding. I just listed here, and I, I won't go through all these. These are uh, available to you if, if you want to take a closer look. But the first point I would make is we found that uh, corrupt officials might be uh, very talented at being dictators or running their, their countries with an iron hand or whatever, but generally they absolutely suck at hiding money. And they make all sorts of really stupid mistakes. Uh, if they were really good at it, if they had perfect what the spies call tradecraft, uh, they will get away with it and we will never discover what they've done. We'll never find the money. Um, but rarely, in the many cases we've looked at in, in our own work, rarely have we found that kind of talent or perfect tradecraft uh, at hiding money. Um, I worked on one case where the official had uh, uh, bragged to his, uh, to his personal assistant about his accounts and would have the assistant get his banker and his fiduciary in the Isle of Man on the phone. And so eventually, uh, uh, she was fired and became a, a good source for us. And uh, you would think, in a, in a, you know, if the official had any, and he was good at this, he would have kept that secret from her. But she knew all about his uh, offshore structure. Um, then another uh, quick piece of advice 
we uh, uh, really value relationships when, with lawyers we, we find and cultivate who themselves help people hide money. Um, they, uh, they're referred to as asset protection lawyers. That's the nice term for hiding money. Um, if you can ever find one and make a source of a lawyer who is proud of what they do, and there, there is a, a community of lawyers who are uh, you know, legitimate, um, but we go to them constantly and say, look, we have a structure where the company is in Panama, the directors are in Switzerland, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and they say, oh, well, that makes sense. Uh, here's why they would have done it that way. And then we ask, well, what are the vulnerabilities of that structure? Uh, and, they're, and they're able to help us with that. Uh, one of the vulnerabilities that you find, even in the most pirate place, even in the worst uh, you know, tax haven offshore jurisdiction, is that there are rules, local rules, for the uh, trustees and fiduciaries and lawyers locally. For example, take, let's go back to the Isle of Man. There's a rule in the Isle of Man that um, if money is contested, anywhere in the world, that is by a even by a lawsuit, even by a civil lawsuit that seeks that money, that the fiduciary is not allowed to, uh, to put that money into the structure. So of course they do it anyway, but um, uh, our, uh, one of our uh, lawyers who helps us has told us a, a kind of a rule within the asset protection community. If you ever aim a blow, if you ever aim trouble at a local fiduciary, they will duck and let the blow hit the client. They will always protect themselves. Um, and then uh, one last thing, I'm sure I'm going, taking too long, but uh, we, uh, we, of course, we use these databases like the, uh, uh, the investigative dashboard that, uh, that give you a kind of a database version of the documents that are filed locally in the Caymans or the Isle of Man or wherever, but we, insist, uh, or we try very hard to get the local paper itself, the hard copy paper, uh, not just what is on these databases. Because the databases contain just almost like a shadow of what's in the actual documents. And the actual documents are much more interesting than what's, on the, what's in the database. Uh, for example, we cracked a case one time by finding a fax number, remember fax numbers, at the top of the page which led back to the actual uh, beneficial owner of this structure, um, uh, which they had, I guess they had faxed the document into the Caymans or whatever, and that fax number revealed their, revealed their secret. But of course, that fax number was not on the, uh, <clears throat> in the database. Um, of course, networking with others, uh, uh, employees, family members, uh, travel agents, and so on, leads to their destruction later, or can lead, if we, uh, investigative reporters, can flip those people. We always start at the bottom. We try to recreate who was around the corrupt official when they were riding high. Um, and, uh, and often those, you know, e even chauffeurs and secretaries have helped us, as I mentioned. Uh, of course, we search on the kids. Um, if the corrupt official has died, uh, you should do everything you can to get to the probate documents. Uh, that is what is filed in court uh, that, uh, about the distribution of their assets to their heirs. Um, we find amazing things in those court filings, uh, including um, uh, fights among uh, children and spouses and so on for these assets that can be very revealing. And then, um, uh, since we're talking about the network around a corrupt official, I should say that there is usually an inner circle, maybe his children or his uh, closest lawyer, but just outside that circle are a variety of people who have been participants in the structuring, uh, perhaps in the uh, tax havens or wherever, who are paid almost nothing to do this help. Uh, and, um, and they're not excited about being accused of helping uh, corruption. Uh, they're there to simply set up companies. They do hundreds of them a day. Maybe they're a secretary or a, you know, an accountant. Um, and um, particularly if they leave the firm that they were working for, again, sort of former employees is a, is a theme here. 
um, we find that they sometimes will flip. Um, and then even competitors, other fiduciaries on these islands or other accounting firms are, are sometimes willing off the record, but helpfully, to blow the whistle. Um, and then of course, as uh, the money is enjoyed, that's where it, it also, uh, uh, we can uh, take, take good advantage of it. Um, here's a pattern we found. Um, we found real estate owned through structures where nobody in the, in the, uh, uh, around the house knew who the beneficial owner of the house was, except for the architect or the interior designer. And the reason is that the corrupt official wants to get certain things right within the house, like the marble in the bathroom, or you know, my mistress wants this, or my wife wants that. And, um, and so they have to come out of the closet just this one time with the architect to go over, you know, what kind of marble. Um, and uh, there are, you know, well-known cases where the architects have been willing to brag or even put on their website pictures of a house, let's say, even if they don't reveal the client on the, on the website, uh, they reveal that they are the architect involved in that mansion. Um, and um, I guess those are my tips. I guess one other thing, uh, we've uh, worked on many cases where everything uh, stayed quiet um, with a structure and untraceable until something went wrong like uh, the deposing, you know, maybe what's happening in Zimbabwe right now, we'll talk about this next year, uh, that is that, the, uh, that the, the, the big man is deposed or dies. Um, and at that point, as as investigators begin to close in, asset hiders, kleptocrat, kleptocrats can really start to panic. Um, uh, I don't know why Gaddafi is on my mind today, but uh, there was a, a news a report that uh, as things went badly for Gaddafi, he he reached out for a uh, uh, a um, an asset lawyer in London, and said that he had a his people said that he had a billion dollars to hide, and the the lawyer turned him down and turned to the press and basically said, I think they looked me up in the yellow pages. So that was uh, the Qaddafi forces uh, panicking as revolution was in the streets uh, and, um, and beginning to make mistakes that we can take advantage of. Thanks. Thank you so much, James. That was so informative, practical, useful, and um, really very interesting. Tom Burgess is in charge of investigations for the Financial Times. He used to be based here in Johannesburg for the FT and also in Lagos. He's written a book called The Looting Machine, and he goes into um, looting and the shenanigans that go on in the oil, the gas, the minerals industries in Africa. Tom, please tell us all about it. They're um, mainly for your amusement. Anyway, uh, it's very good to be here. I think we're honoured as well to be joined by two profoundly hungover Amabagani reporters after their richly deserved award victory last night. Look up to Files. Perhaps a round of applause. <laughs> I'm sure that hurts the head, actually. Um, I, yeah, I did spend a long time living in Africa and wrote a book about oil and mining, but I actually wanted to talk, and I'm more than happy to talk about any of that, 
anybody wants to. Um, but I wanted to follow up James's talk by talking about a particular technique that I think is neglected um, uh, in investigative journalism, particularly about looted money, about um, uh, corruption, and that's um, narrative. Um, some of the biggest stories of our time have come from huge uh, data leaks. Um, obviously, the most relevant ones for us are the, the offshore leaks, the Panama Papers, and the most recently the Paradise Papers. And they've been examples of fine and, and courageous journalism and often beautifully written. Um, but I think there's also a danger when we start to rely more and more on this, this kind of information. Um, and that's that sometimes we miss the content, uh, the context, rather. And we, we, we miss the, the narrative of what human beings are, are doing. Um, that's obviously part of the design of offshore structures, but um, in order to really pierce offshore secrecy and to understand how looting works and kleptocratic politics works, which is spreading ever more widely around the world, I think this is vital that we understand it. Um, because without that context and without that narrative, we don't really have a story in any clear sense. I know. Is that better? Well, getting there. Um, Yeah, more atmospheric. Chasing dark money. Um, so uh, my point is that we don't understand the human action and the narrative. We don't have, in the true sense, a story. Uh, sometimes in our discussions about investigative journalism, this, this idea of the art of storytelling, I think, is ignored and, and overlooked. And we see it as very much secondary to um, the tenacious reporting, to the cultivation of sources. Um, but I would argue that it should be foremost in our minds, not just when we come to the writing phase or the, or the, um, uh, the storyboarding phase, but um, throughout reporting and at the beginning. Um, because it's how we make sure that we're always considering the human agency at work, and it's how we make sure, uh, it's what keeps us honest, I think. Um, and I'd like to use uh, an example, one example of a year-long investigation that we just finished, and uh, I'll touch on as we go a few of the other techniques that we used and sources that I think uh, might, be, might be valuable uh, for people pursuing similar work. Um, but it's a story we, in which we use lots of different investigative techniques, but it only really unlocked when we understood the narrative and started to frame it like that. Uh, and it began with... So at the beginning of the, um, when Trump's candidacy started to look serious, we, like lots of others, began to look at his business interests and particularly the connections between Trump's uh, real estate, business deals, and uh, money from the former Soviet Union. Um, in the course of that, I heard about a connection between some of Trump's properties and a Kazakh money laundering scheme. Um, at that phase, what we did was draw on what I think is a hugely underused resource. Uh, do, how many people use Pacer? Quite a few. But yeah, but I think it's not as widely used as it could be. It's the, for those who don't know, it's the, um, it's the electronic archive of the US legal system, and it, it costs negligible fees. And I'm always stunned that more people don't, that, well, basically, that everyone doesn't use it. Not every court filing is in it, and not every court uh, files its information in there, but compared to somewhere like the UK, where it's fantastically difficult to get hold of court documents, you can get them, and it's very slow and costly. Pacer is a fabulous resource. It's, a, it's effectively a huge data leak hiding in plain sight. Um, so what we did was to go through Pacer and find, with a little bit of guidance from a couple of sources, the, um, the cases in which the Kazakh authorities had laid out their case against what they said was this massive money laundering exercise by uh, a couple of Kazakh families. And in the course of those thousands of pages of filings are a list of some of the assets uh, that the Kazakhs said had been used for laundering. And they included the Trump uh, Soho and uh, other properties and companies connected to Trump. 
Um, we developed sources around that, and we got some more material that was, um, that, was, that was confidential given to us, and we started to piece together this picture of Trump's business model, which is effectively, as we now understand ever more clearly, to be a sponge for dirty money around the world. It's the classic business model of New York real estate. Um, this man, Presented, is it? Apologies. Um, is um, said to be the architect of the money laundering scheme, Mukhtar Abliazov. Uh, anybody come across him? Yeah. Um, so he was accused in these court papers by the Kazakhs of stealing so much money um, that they called him the Bernie Madoff of Central Asia. Billions after billions after billions looted out of a, a Kazakh bank, BTA bank. Uh, all um, exquisitely documented in the court filings, which themselves contained um, uh, mutual legal assistance letters to Switzerland, contained parts of British civil rulings, uh, a, a really rich bank of data from, from PACER and, and eventually from UK court filings as well and from our sources. And we backed up this work, we backed up this, can you hear okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, the we backed up what was in these court filings with um, pretty standard corporate registry stuff, but I, I, we find particularly, I'm sure there are many, many tools that people in this room use, but Orbis and Arachnis, um, Arachnis especially because of the way it allows you to search worldwide corporate um, registries are, are very, very useful, and they're both companies prepared to work with journalists, uh, in some cases to lower what can be very high fees. Um, and we could have left it there and had our story about Trump, and we did, we did write a story about Trump and how dirty money goes through his business interests. Um, but that would have missed the narrative, as we would discover. That would have only shown the part of the story that we set out to show in the first place. Um, because as you look more deeply into it, and uh, do we have any Kazakhs? or Central Asians? Alas, uh, alas no. Um, a hard place to be a journalist. But uh, there is, as ever, more than one side to the story. And as we, we delved more deeply into our work, and as, crucially, we spent a lot of time on our right to replies, I think this is another very important element of building these narratives. It's, it's, it's easy, often, to decide to go for the shortest possible length of time at the end of a targeted investigation to get your write a reply, often for just a sort of a legalistic uh, hoop to jump through. Um, I think it's very, very valuable to spend weeks, if not months, with t talking to the targets. There's obviously the risk, in some cases, of your story getting blown. Um, but similarly, there's the potential great benefit of seeing something in the round. Uh, so we spend a lot of time with Abelazov's people. Um, I went to interview him, it, where he was living in hiding in Paris. Um, and we started to delve more deeply into Kazakh politics and the, uh, the, the deeply kleptocratic system that they have there. Kazakhstan, for those who don't know, made a huge amount of money from, um, from oil and from uranium sales and from the kickbacks that, that, that come so frequently in the oil and mining industries, squirreled away in the, in, in the ways that we heard about um, moments ago. And what they were able to do was to do what the, the most ambitious kleptocrats do, which is to to surround themselves with the outward symbols of legitimacy. So that can be through the, 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 the central dirty money structures, so the shell companies, the lawyers, and the rest of it. But it also involves something more subtle, as, as we've seen in South Africa recently. It involves image laundering. So in this case, um, Nazarbayev, the president of Kazakhstan there uh, since 1989, and Tony Blair, a man he hired as his advisor, he used to be the prime minister of Britain, and now himself has made a lot of money and some fairly dubious friends. Um, and what we did was to start to work on a new story. Uh, and if you're interested in getting more into the nuts and bolts of this aspect, um, that really thinking deeply about the narrative and how understanding the narrative frames your reporting as well as writing, I would recommend this. Um, anybody read that? Yeah, a, a, a classic. Um, so. William Blundell used to be the A1 editor of the Wall Street Journal. Um, 
whatever we might think about the journal these days, it has a rich tradition of these beautifully written long form pieces that turn off the front um, and obviously now just uh, very well presented digitally. And um, this, for me, I'm sure others will have other suggestions, but this is the best guide to long form writing. And what it does is it, uh, it uses writing techniques to organize the reporting. And then, obviously, organise the writing. I, for me, that's some of, this is some of the hardest stuff in investigative journalism: is turning it uh, into uh, understanding the narrative of what you've discovered. So Blundell has this idea about a main theme statement, a, a statement you come up with at the beginning of your investigation, um, and this is critical for me. I think you have to have, if you believe that the narrative is is all important, then you need that simple hypothesis, uh, like a beachhead. Uh, just, or just a simple question at the very, very beginning to organize what you're actually going for. Because sometimes we have much too vague an idea of what we're pursuing. Um, and with Abliazov, what we went for was, is this man uh, a master criminal? Or is he a persecuted political dissident, um, as he says he is? Any better? Sounds exactly the same to me. Is that better? Right, well. Um, I have been warned that some of the people we wrote about in the Kazakh story are trying to bug us and interfere us with various well. Maybe they're just slowly turning down the microphone from Astana. You know, who knows? Uh, um, and trying to shift to understanding the, the human beings at the center of this story after uh, all that work with all those big data sets uh, led to a change of technique. So we, we went very old school and I just went around Western Europe and the States and Central Asia doing um, a lot of very long interviews, um, including in, has anyone been to Astana? I would highly recommend Astana as one of the weirdest places around. It's sort of Abuja on steroids. Um, it, it, it's a city that if you can imagine, if you, I think, were to try to call an architect and say, can you design me a city for kleptocrats? <laughs> I think that's, that, that's what you get. I mean, it has some brilliant people in it and some people who are trying to change things, but it also has some people um, who are looting the place dry. Um, and that's one uh, of the final points I'd, I'd make is to remember that however big the data sets, there's nothing more important than being there. Um, and I know budgets are, are, are always tighter, but no one ever understood a story from afar. Um, so in the end, what we ended up doing uh, was trying to tell a classic uh, narrative in the kind of New Yorker style. Um, in, I mean, my writing heroes and the people I think everyone should read all the time are those, uh, some of those current New Yorker writers, the sort of Patrick Radden Keefe's, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Julie Meyer, uh, Elizabeth Colbert, these people who, with the incredible editing team there and at other, especially US magazines, turn um, deep investigative projects into totally gripping and compelling long form prose. Um, so we, we told it in a very simple and straightforward way, as best we could, through one guy's story, and that allowed us to illuminate this whole world of uh, propagandists and private spies and launderers and lobbyists um, and in the end I suppose we decided uh, w at the risk of s spoiling the, uh, the the piece which is pretty long um, we decided that Abliazov like many people in these kleptocratic systems are both crooks and dissidents and I think it's crucial to try to understand that as we get deeper and deeper into understanding the offshore world and the scale of the global kleptocratic system that's enveloping us all in one way or another to understand how kleptocratic politics works from the inside and that everybody in their own head is a dissident how, and that everybody feels that um, they have to protect their billions because other people are nefarious. Um, that's vital to understand that, to the human agency within that system. That's the only way that the spread of kleptocracy, I think, will be curtailed. Um, uh, and my final thought would be that All around us, we're increasingly aware, are these information wars. Um, whether it's Bell Pottinger working with the 
on behalf of the Guptas here in South Africa to launder their image and distort the truth, or uh, the Russian black PR campaign in the US election. Um, and, and I think that means for us as investigative reporters, uh, we have to be ever more aware, not just of the information we're receiving, but how it's coming to us, how it's being manipulated and what it's being used for. And increasingly, I think that those questions themselves, as we track the looted money around the world, understanding how information is being uh, manipulated and abused, that is the story. Um, I think that that's a decent place to stop. Apologies for my appalling use of PowerPoint as well. My editor says power, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Thank you very much for telling us how to, um, or encouraging us to write these dirty stories about a lot of filth in a beautiful way and telling the human story of what really is going on here and how our societies are increasingly shaped by these um, looting projects. I learned something new about image laundering. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've been through an image laundering campaign, as you've said, um, and it's been really tough for the South African press to make the links between the granular information that you find and um, the, the heightened need to, to launder the images of certain individuals and how that w feeds into the politics of the day. I don't know how to pronounce your surname very well. I have practiced. <laughs> Miranda. <laughs> Miranda comes from Bosnia. She's one of the country's leading investigative journalists there. She's been responsible for a number of exposés that have won her numerous awards. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, my, my surname is so difficult, not even anybody in my country can get it right. <laughs> and I'm not joking. If you try to read press clippings about me, you're going to find all kinds of variations of my surname with the press. So I, I don't know if I was privileged or it, it, it was just like a destiny not to really report in my country. So in Bosnia, while I'm probably one of the most well-known Bosnian journalists, I, I have done very little stories. Um, most of my reporting was in, uh, like early on in a country like Montenegro, which is very similar to you know, any dictatorship you could have. Um, and then currently I'm working in Central Asia and Azerbaijan. So those are countries where you have single president for like 30 years. Um, those are captured state. Everything is controlled by, you know, family plus few cronies. And those are countries which have billions in wealth to steal. So as a reporter, it's actually a great challenge and a privilege to be able to uncover stories that involve billions of dollars that are stolen. Of course, it's bad for the country because you know, most of regular people in those places uh, don't live well. They don't have the basic freedoms. They don't have the basic means for living. But for me as a reporter, it's been a great journey, basically uncovering a number of stories. And I'm going to talk about some of them and talk about you know, how I do that and how I work with uh, reporters inside the countries. I don't know how, how familiar you are with Central Asia, but there are very few uh, free journalists there, and there are no investigative journalists. Um, and many journalists who actually e even dare to do something and report about corruption, report about ruling elite, they basically get you know, either jailed or they're forced to leave their countries. So you don't really find any information inside the country or any people who can work inside the country. And then other problem is you don't have a public records. So while you're accustomed to the idea that you can go and you know, file a freedom of information request and get information or that um, you, know, you can go and interview a president or interview an official and they're going to respond to your, your questions, 
you, you can forget about it in Central Asia. Most commonly, they actually get a list of questions they're going to ask at press conferences, and they have answers prepared. So uh, it, it, it's almost impossible to be really a journalist inside the country. But we have done a lot of stories reporting about the corruption and about the theft of you know, um, national wealth, basically by looking outside the country. Um, and it, it, for me, it was you know, a great privilege to actually cooperate with many journalists in uh, many countries abroad, like in Sweden, like in... Is it okay? Oh, yeah, okay. So, like in Sweden, where we broke the stories about, you know, Gulnara Karimova, she was the daughter of the president of Uzbekistan, about um, Aliyev's, uh, the, the fam first family in Azerbaijan, and how they were receiving bribes, but also many other places, because with what happens, like when you're thinking about looted uh, wealth, the most difficult thing is, for example, uncovering the bribe. But somehow, when we look at the international companies bribing their way into the country, the information about the bribe itself is often hidden in the reports and the documents um, you know, filed in, in some country abroad. So I'll give you a most recent, we are currently looking at one of the oil companies, and we have discovered that in order for one company to secure a 10-year exclusive contract, they went and paid 125 million bribe. And the way they have done it, and, and, and this is what is really interesting, this was all in an you know, annual account file 10 years ago in Malta. And I'm not kidding you. And what they did is they went and set up a company, gave it to free to some other offshore company. That company got the contract, and after that they bought the company back and paid $125 million. So thinking about the looted wealth, a lot of our stories actually come from, for example, reading financial statements. And not the financial statements in the country you expected. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, uncovering corruption by my favorite company, Tilia Sonera, um, you know, none of the corruption is inside of Sweden, at least not filed in the reports inside of Sweden. But most of the information we were able to obtain in, for example, Netherlands or in Tur Turkey, where they had their own holdings. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the stories that I've done in Azerbaijan. And, you know, if, if you've heard the first, uh, first part of this panel, you know, there was a lot of, count, like, how do you follow the businesses? How do you follow the, the companies? And some of the stories we were able to do is, for example, that the first family of Azerbaijan owns 10 hotel in Baku, hotels in Baku. And those are like five-star hotels. And, you know, you know, I told you, there are no information. You can't find the business records. If you actually try to go to business registry, it will not tell you who owns companies. But strangely enough, in one of the accounts, they went and listed every single business they owned. And then, yeah, it, it, it's kind of crazy, but by pure chance of getting one single account of a company, we were able to find out all the other companies in their network. Um, then we were looking into banks because the first family, of course, controls the banks. And, you know, strangely enough, the banks actually do have financial statements out in the open. So we were able to actually look the inside deals and how they were funding their own businesses. And then, you know, based, based on their internal knowledge of what's going to happen with the country, you know, benefit even from a currency collapse when everybody else was suffering. Yeah, this was the story about the banks. And then... Um, this was a story about uh, how they captured the state telecom operator. And again, it was a tr by following the trace of companies abroad rather than inside the country, because inside the country we couldn't get anything. And of course, because of the leaks. Um, you know, ICJ is going to publish the Paradise Papers leaks um, uh, today, so maybe there will be names for your own countries. This is where that start, uh, story started. We basically found out that they own an offshore company, and then we were able to track it and find out what it was doing inside the country. So other things we do, we, uh, we look into the properties. And again, inside the countries, no, forget about lo uh, land records. But then if you're talking about a corrupt official who has millions to spend, they're not really going to spend them inside the country. They're going to spend them on mansions in London, in France, you know, in Spain, in Miami. And those are places where you can actually get land records. And I'll give you a few trips, how we, tricks we, how we got it. So in the case of uh, our first family, we discovered three properties in London. And, you know, um, 
uh, Jim was mentioning, uh, for example, looking at the architects. That's what we were doing. One of the one of the big, uh, uh, it's it's almost like it's a huge villa in London. Basically, was uh, uh, renovated by a, a London architectural firm, and they went and posted all the photos and the costs and you know everything they've done, and you could see the uh, gold-plated uh, you know walls and uh, stairs and everything else. Other ways we discovered the properties is we were following their Instagram profiles. And on, yeah, it, it's a beautiful way to basically, you know, if you have fashion magazines, you know, where they like to pose for pictures, if they have Instagram, Facebook, I mean, we, we just keep following them. And in one of the Instagram posts, one of the photos of the president was like, oh, look at my new mansion in London. And they were like, ooh, <laughs> they have a mansion in London. And then um, at the time, we were able to get the exact geolocation from the picture they had posted. Because I, I, there, there is a session here, I think, at the conference was like how you can track some of the information. And basically, for us, it was identifying actually the building in which they had the property. And then we sent a reporter to London, and we said at the reception, we have a package to deliver. Can you tell us, uh, you know, if uh, Leila Aliyeva lived here? And he confirmed, and he was like, she's now out for gym, but she's going to be back in an hour. Come back, and you can deliver the package. And that's how we confirmed. So we didn't know like exact apartment, but we knew she lived in the building, and we knew what the price of the you know apartments were and so on. And other ways we determined the properties. For example, in London, you actually um, usually if there is a, like a building and you own an apartment in a the building, they have a managing company for the building, and one of the daughters was actually a director in the managing company for the building. So that's how we found that you know she owns another property um, in London. Um, in other countries, for example, when we were looking into Gulnara Karimova, the daughter of the president of Uzbekistan, she had properties in France. And the beautiful thing about the France is the most uh, foreigners who own properties there would set up first a company, and then through the company they would own a property. So for us, once we and we were able to search for the names of directors, and we identified one of her, you know, people who would hold the assets on her name. Once we found that, in the records we just found which villa she bought and for how much money and when, and then we were able to get all the other records. So that's kind of like how we find out about the different assets abroad. We follow the companies, and we also look at what they're doing. Um, these are some of the examples. Um, then, you know, yachts. We've done a number of stories, basically, again, following the social media profiles. Uh, seeing the picture, seeing on which yacht they appear. Um, and in our case, we identified that Aliyev's actually used two different yachts. The yachts, we basically tracked them by name and we discovered they were owned by the state oil company. But from there, we were basically able to use tools like marine traffic to actually follow the location of the yachts. So we would know that today it's in you know, France, uh, you know, tomorrow it's going to be in Italy, and the next, you know, in three days it's going to be in Malta or wherever. So, and we could do that, like, live, actually track, you know, where the yacht is. And then uh, we collaborated with a, a reporter in Italy and discovered that, you know, same as, um, you know, we have Facebook, the, uh, the ship crew, they also have their own social media. So we were able actually to identify people who actually worked on the yacht and then go and talk to them and find out that uh, the wife of the president wasn't happy at a 30 meters long yacht and that she wanted the bigger one because she felt nauseous and, and so on. So you get these uh, really, really nice juicy details about you know, their lifestyle and what they do. And yeah, this is just some images of this. And then we did another thing, we followed the aircrafts. And we were um, basically, uh, I don't know if you were at the arm session yesterday, but my colleague Lawrence was describing how you can actually track the air, aircraft live and also how you can use the plane spotters uh, to basically identify the images of, you know, of the planes and where they're landing. So for us, one of the things was we knew where the government plane of Azerbaijan was going by basically following different plane spotter websites and finding all the planes and then uh, you know, doing a database where we identified every flight, and then we were looking where the president was at the time. And that's how we discovered that many of the London trip or many of the Switzerland trips, basically, the president was inside the countries, but his daughters were basically, you know, going either on shopping trips or on depositing money trips or, you know, vacation trips. <clears throat> 
And then the last thing, you know, we follow their lifestyle. And, you know, um, I think Jim mentioned like $100,000 watch. You know, you know, for me, the first idea of like, why should we track the lifestyle was looking into the, uh, the former prime minister of Montenegro. You know, he suddenly, you know, he had a salary which was like 1,000 euros a month. And then suddenly he had a 100,000 watch. And it was like, no, there's no way on earth you could ever afford a 100,000 watch. So we started looking at the daughters of the president. And of course, we discovered like a $5,000 bag and then, you know, $1,000 dress. And then we discovered the 160,000 bag. Um, and the way we were doing it is basically by, you know, just downloading everything we could ever find on social media. And then we used the reverse image search to basically, you know, we, we would crop this uh, purse and then we would do a reverse image search to identify what kind of purse that could be. And then we would find that it, this is brand and, and so on. And then you kind of see what the cost is and, you know, how luxurious it is and so on. So how do I do this? And, you know, we've done so many projects, you know, looking in Uzbekistan, looking in Azerbaijan. You know, most recently we published stories in Kazakhstan at about one of the top officials basically uncovering again a billion dollars empire that nobody in Kazakhstan knew about. You know, we are doing similar story in Tajikistan, which we are gonna release in a month. I mean, those are like the worst countries in the world to report. And the way we are doing it, basically using public records, not inside the country, but actually elsewhere. So, you know, everything you think, you know, you can not get in your place where you're reporting, you know, if they have any trace abroad, and in most cases they do, because, you know, what's the point of spending your money if you're only seen in your country? I mean, what we have discovered, you know, that the whole idea of people who steal money from their, loot their own countries is they want to go abroad and show off. You know, they want to be treated as celebrities, as, you know, um, a, a, a public figures, and, you know, be in the close circles of the, you know, queens and princes and, you know, top businessmen and, you know, actors and so on. So in order to have that, they have to spend money abroad. And once they start spending abroad, there is a whole range of public records you can be getting, you know, with, um, from court cases to, um, you know, business records to land records, you know, sometimes even police records and, you know, divorce records and, you know, all kinds of them. And the way I start normally, when I, you know, whenever I start with a new family, because for me it's, you know, I don't know anything about, for example, Tajikistan, or I know anything about Kazakhstan when I first start looking into them. I spend time figuring out who is who. And that means getting the names of not only, you know, the top officials, but also their family members, figuring out who their lawyers are, who their close friends are, who they hang out with. And I usually create this big database with all kinds of names I can go after. And then once I do that, like this is one of the examples of the names and the databases I create. And then I basically start running them through a um, number of databases. And, you know, there are databases like, you know, Orbis, LexisNexis. You can always, often get them in libraries, so you don't have to pay for them. They're quite expensive. But like business schools, big libraries would have them. And, you know, they have, um, you know, millions on, 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 on records on ownership of companies. And you can search, for example, by name of director, even at places where you actually can't do it by doing just a regular search. Like if you go to, you know, um, uh, whatever, um, you know, Bosnian Business Registry, you probably will not be able to, share, uh, to search by the name of shareholders. This database allows you to search by the names of shareholders. You know, Lexis allows you, for example, to search by nationality. So I can do a search to find every person from South Africa who has a business in UK. So it, it's really, really amazing. So it's kind of like a big, you know, sea of things where you can just go and fish and fish. You know, then you have things like ICJ's, you know, Panama Papers database and Offshore League database where you can search for your names. And it's so worthwhile, you know, when we did the last Kazakh story, you know, we ba went back to, per uh, to Panama Papers and we suddenly found things we never found when we originally worked on the Panama Papers. Because, you know, we had new names, new people, new companies to search for. So it's always good to go back. You know, investigative dashboard, uh, we will have a session on Sunday about it. Basically, it has, 
you know, hundreds of different databases where you can search for your names, you can search by your country, and see what kind of leads you get. And then every country has a business registry. And, you know, even the most notorious of the offshore jurisdictions have a business registry. And, it, you know, just as one example, when we were working with SVT on a Telia Sonera investigation in Uzbekistan, you know, the whole story basically came through from Gibraltar. And, you know, Gibraltar is a tax haven and everybody thought there's nothing you can get there. And all it took was a phone call to a business registry and, you know, hi, is it sunny in Gibraltar? Yes, it's wonderful. You know, I'm glad to meet you, blah, blah, blah. How can I get the records? And the woman's saying, yeah, I'm going to ship it to you and it's going to be at your home in two weeks. I mean, it's literally, this is all it took. And in many of these places, all it takes is a phone call and a reporter and trying to find out what they can ha get and how. And, you know, finding a friendly person to help them. You know, one of the things I love are official gazettes. In some countries you have them, in other countries you don't have them. But basically, it's kind of like a public announcement of every company. And it's really amazing. In some countries, like in Middle East, you know, every time somebody uh, gets a new, buys a new property, or for example, even in Switzerland, when the, when the new property is sold, it's actually published in the official gazette. So you know the buyer, you know the seller, and you know the price. It's amazing. Amazing is a source of information for you to dig in. And then, of course, court records in UK, India, US, I mean, those are my to-go places. Because if you have a major businessman and he gets in any kind of dispute, he's not gonna, he, it's very unlikely he's gonna settle it in your own country. But he will likely go to US, he will go to UK, and you know, that's where you can get records and you know, affidavits and testimonies and so on. And of course, scrape database. So I'm gonna stop here because we have another panelist. Uh, but if you want my slides, I'm happy to share them with you, and you'll, yeah, thank you. Really, how exciting is that? It's, it's a really juicy approach to doing the work we do, which can often be depressing. Um, Koami Elton Donangri is a Togolese journalist. He describes himself as a citoyen du monde, citizen of the world by conviction. And he says he's very passionate about rights and human rights in particular. And he says that his soul is seized with many grand dreams. Hello, guys. Sorry, I would love to go in English, but unfortunately, I'm not so good at English, so I'll go in French. And uh, you can have your headset if you don't understand uh, French. And I think it's better I speak French, and you won't understand me in French. Okay, you won't understand me if someone, a professional, translates it to, uh, to English. Uh, moi, je m'appelle Maxime Dominique, comme il a dit tout à l'heure. Je viens de, du Togo, un pays qui aurait pu... Okay, I can give you some a while to collect your headsets. <laughs> Sorry to, you know, to have you, to disturb you with my, my, my poor English. Okay, I was saying that I'm coming from uh, a Togo, a country that can be called that could be called Kazakhstan or Tajikistan because you know they have the same similarities. Still, Togo is situated in Africa, West Africa.
Ok, c'est bon, merci. Ok, euh, je disais que je viens d'une autre kleptocratie qui aurait pu être située en, Af en Asie centrale, qui aurait pu s'appeler le Kazakhstan ou le Tadjikistan, parce qu'ayant les mêmes caractéristiques que, que, le que ces pays d'Asie centrale, le Togo est dirigé euh, par une famille depuis 50 ans, 1967, depuis qu'ils sont au pouvoir. Je n'étais pas encore né, peut-être beaucoup de personnes ici n'étaient pas encore nées. Le Togo est un petit pays de 7 millions d'habitants sur 56 km km2, un peu plus grand que l'Israël, que la Suisse, euh, mais un petit pays quand même, qui est situé euh, en Afrique de l'Ouest. Le Togo fait partie des pays les plus frappés par les flux illicites. Entre 2002 et 2011, il y a eu près de 200 milliards de dollars de flux illicites sortis du Togo, illégalement, et le Togo fait partie des premiers pays en Afrique euh, frappés par euh, euh, les flux illicites. Le secteur euh, minier représente euh, euh, 22% des, des exportations, mais génère euh, que 4% de, des recettes du pays. Les principales ressources exportées, des, les ressources minières, bien entendu, exportées du Togo sont le phosphate. Le phosphate qui est euh, exploité depuis, avant même l'indépendance, avant même 1960. Et donc le calcaire aussi fait partie des, 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 des ressources minières exportées du Togo. Et il y a l'or. Le Togo, curieusement, ne produit pas l'or. Le Togo n'est pas un producteur d'or, mais l'or fait partie des, des, grands, des grandes matières premières exportées du Togo. L'or est le troisième, le troisième produit euh, exporté du Togo. Euh, euh, et donc, vous avez une idée de, de, de quoi il s'agit. Il fait même partie, il fait 24% des, des exportations, bien que le pays n'étant pas un producteur d'or. Donc, le pays constitue une plateforme de trafic, en fait, de, 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 de ce produit. Le Togo a produit aussi du fer, dont la production est suspendue récemment. Le manganèse, le phosphate. Bientôt, le Togo va lancer une exploitation de phosphate carbonaté. 2 milliards de tonnes, ça va être la plus grande, le plus grand gisement de phosphate carbonaté en Afrique subsaharienne. Et le pétrole, le pétrole on n'est pas encore officiellement producteur de pétrole, mais il y a eu des explorations qui ont été faites et il y a eu des conflits autour de la gestion du contrat. Et pour l'instant, c'est suspendu. Bon, je vous ai donné toutes ces précisions pour vous dire, présenter un peu l'aspect du pays, parce que je vais essayer de voir comment est-ce qu'on peut traquer un peu les pillages des ressources euh, euh, naturelles euh, euh, de, de certains de nos pays. Voilà. Tout à l'heure, je vous ai dit un peu euh, toutes les ressources que le Togo exploite, euh, bien que le, le pays soit un, un très petit pays. Mais il se fait que, comme vous le savez, vous avez certainement déjà entendu parler de malédiction des ressources. Je ne sais pas s'il y a des gens ici qui ont déjà entendu parler de malédiction des ressources. Le Togo fait bel et bien partie des pays qui sont frappés, atteints par la malédiction des ressources. Parce que si vous allez au Togo, les zones minières sont les zones les plus pauvres. Et donc, l'exploitation minière a plutôt appauvri, appauvri, autant pour moi, les communautés, les populations. Et il y a une tension permanente entre les industries minières et les communautés minières, les communautés qui ont dû céder leurs terres pour l'exploitation minière. Le personnel, les, 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 ceux qui travaillent au sein des, des entreprises minières au Togo sont tout le temps en grève. Actuellement même, euh, la plus grande usine, en tout cas minière euh, au Togo, qui exploite le, le, le phosphate, qui est une société publique, euh, a vu, bon, les, les personnes qui travaillent là-bas sont en grève, et ils le sont depuis euh, des mois déjà. Euh, en 2015, il y a eu 700 personnes pour cause de guerre qui ont été licenciées d'une de, usine d'exploitation des carcaires. Et donc, je suis en train de je vais essayer de parler de, de deux sociétés en fait, sur lesquelles j'ai travaillé. Une qui est une société publique qui a travaillé sur, qui exploite le phosphate. Une autre qui est une société privée euh, euh, et dont le nom a figuré euh, dans, le, dans, le, euh, dans, la, dans la base de données des Panama Papers. Voilà. Tout à l'heure, je vous ai présenté euh, tout ce que le Togo exploite. Et je vous ai dit aussi que les, 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 les populations, ni ceux qui travaillent, ni ceux qui vivent autour de ces mines profitent de, de, de l'exploitation minière. Et la grande question, what is the money going? Où va l'argent? Alors, donc je vais présenter le cas de deux sociétés. Wassem, Wassem c'est une société euh, indienne, c'est une société privée qui a des, des, des ramifications dans plusieurs pays euh, euh, en Afrique, au Ghana, au Niger, au Mali, en Côte d'Ivoire, au Congo, Brazzaville, au Kenya, à Madagascar, Inde. Et euh, cette société euh, a figuré parmi, euh, euh, en tout cas dans la base de données de, 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 la World, de, de Panama Papers, parce qu'ils ont aussi créé euh, des sociétés euh, offshore via euh, Monsac Fonseca. 
et donc des sociétés euh, à Delaware, aux îles Vierges britanniques. Et ils ont beaucoup d'acquaintances avec les, les, les officiels au Togo. Et donc les violations des droits des travailleurs, euh, euh, ils violent et puis, allègrement les droits des travailleurs sans aucun risque. Ils ont la protection militaire. Et donc autant d'indices qui, qui ont attiré notre attention sur euh, cette société. Allez voir un peu euh, euh, ce, que, ce que fait cette société exactement. La deuxième société, c'est une société publique, société d'État, mais qui est plutôt dirigée par euh, un Israélien du nom de Rafi Ederi, un Israélien qui est un ami du président, dont le nom ne figure pas officiellement dans la hiérarchie, dans l'organigramme de la société. Vous ne verrez nulle part son nom dans l'organigramme de la société, mais c'est lui qui a la décision sur tout. Il ne réside pas au Togo, il vient euh, quelquefois, il, il vient chaque fois, et chaque mois autant pour moi, mais c'est lui qui a la décision sur tout. Il est au-dessus et de, de la direction et du conseil d'administration. Il a autour de lui son fils, la copine de son fils et d'autres amis. Et... Euh, euh, voilà, parlant de, 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 de la SNPT qui est une société publique donc qui exploite le, 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 le phosphate et qui est en principe dirigée par euh, un expatrié qui est un ami du président, qui est un israélien. En fouillant autour de cette société, nous avons découvert, vous avez reconnu certainement euh, les très célèbres Gupta ici en Afrique du Sud euh, euh, qui, sont, euh, qui font partie euh, des gros clients de, de, de cette société-là. Et donc, euh, eux-mêmes, ils ne transforment pas, ils ne transforment pas le, le, le phosphate, mais ils, ils, ils constituent des intermédiaires, c'est-à-dire qu'ils achètent le phosphate, ils vont vendre. Et donc, la formule, le fait que le Togo ait la capacité d'aller directement vendre à des transformateurs, mais souvent obligé de passer par des intermédiaires, ça a attiré notre attention. Ça fait partie des indices euh, qui nous ont attirés, euh, qui, qui nous ont poussés à investiguer autour, autour de ces pratiques. Voilà. Comme, 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 on, comme je, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, euh, par exemple, euh, parlant de, de Wassem, vous avez vu, ils sont dans plusieurs pays, ils ont des filiales dans plusieurs pays en Afrique, ils ont des sociétés dans des, dans des pays qu'on appelle des, des paradis fiscaux. Ces indices, en principe, en, en, tant, que nous, en tant que journalistes d'investigation, je pense que ce sont des indices qui doivent euh, nous pousser à nous intéresser à ces genres de sociétés. C'est vrai que c'est compliqué de les avoir tout de suite, de le voir tout de suite, mais euh, déjà le simple fait que nous puissions avoir des sociétés qui soient basées chez nous, mais qui soient obligées d'avoir des filiales dans certains pays, ça doit attirer notre attention et nous dire qu'attention, il y a une fumée ici, euh, il y a peut-être un feu, un feu, un feu, un feu euh, caché quelque part derrière. Et nous, journalistes, vu que ces sociétés, vu que euh, le pillage se fait de façon organisée et que le pillage, par exemple, si ceux qui font le pillage, s'ils si font le pillage ici, Rarement, ils déposent le fruit du pillage dans le pays où ils ont, ils ont fait le pillage. Il nous faut, nous aussi, nous organiser de telle sorte à suivre le processus où passe l'argent jusqu'à à sa, à sa destination. Maintenant, venant d'un pays comme le nôtre, un pays, un très, pays, un très petit pays comme, comme le nôtre, avec des rédactions qui n'ont pas les moyens de, de Financial Times, par exemple, c'est compliqué, bien souvent compliqué, de, 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 de pouvoir, par exemple, se payer des voyages pour aller euh, euh, investiguer autour de ces sociétés-là, euh, partout, partout où ils sont. D'où l'importance pour nous d'avoir, de nous organiser aussi pour avoir par exemple les moyens, même si on ne va pas se déplacer, avoir par exemple des contacts dans, dans, dans ces pays pour, pour pouvoir nous aider. Moi je me rappelle bien que euh, dans, le, dans le cas de Panama Papers, euh, grâce euh, à, à, ICI, à ICIG, nous avons pu, moi j'ai pu avoir des informations d'autres pays dans lesquels j'aurais dû me mettre, si je n'avais pas des, des contacts dans ces pays par exemple, le, le ACIG a dû me mettre en contact avec... Euh, euh, un journaliste au Ghana qui euh, m'a aidé à, à, à faire des de, de, de recoupements. Et puis, en dehors du de, 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 de fait qu'il est important d'avoir des contacts, nous avons besoin aussi d'avoir certains moyens. Tout à l'heure, j'ai dit que le Togo euh, aurait pu être euh, le Kazakhstan ou le Tadjikistan. Euh, euh, Miranda a présenté un peu la situation un peu de, de ces pays d'Asie centrale où il est, il est difficile d'avoir des informations, où il est difficile d'avoir des sources. Et, et par exemple, quand moi je travaillais sur euh, 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 bon, les exploitations du, du phosphate, euh, comment est-ce que les gens s'organisent pour piller les ressources du phosphate, c'était difficile d'avoir des informations au Togo. Mais qu'est-ce que j'ai fait 
Euh, nous savons, je, je, bon, je sais, j'ai pu quand même avoir quelques informations sur les pays avec lesquels euh, le Togo deal en termes de phosphate. Et donc, à défaut de trouver des, informa des informations d'exportation, je suis allé chercher des informations d'importation de ces pays. Supposons que, par exemple, le Togo exporte du phosphate vers l'Australie. À défaut de trouver des informations sur la quantité du, du phosphate que le Togo importe, exporte vers l'Australie, c'est peut-être plus facile de trouver des informations en Australie euh, sur la quantité de phosphate que l'Australie importe du Togo. Donc, ça, c'est des techniques par exemple, qui nous permettent de contourner un peu la censure, le refus euh, d'accès à l'information dans ces pays. Et puis, par exemple, euh, euh, on peut traquer les navires. Tout à l'heure, Birinda a parlé de comment est-ce qu'on peut traquer les, les, les avions, vu que, essentiellement, les navires sont euh, utilisés pour euh, le transport des matières premières. Il m'est arrivé, par exemple, de suivre les navires, de voir un peu, euh, il y a des, des, des plateformes en ligne qui vous permettent de suivre un peu les, les, les déplacements, le flux, le trafic des navires euh, dans votre port. Et donc, c'est aussi euh, un moyen euh, alternatif pour savoir que, voilà, aujourd'hui, il y a tel navire qui est venu dans notre port, qui est parti avec, avec, avec tel, tel, tel minerai. Comment s'organiser euh, Parlant des sources, les bases de données, euh, comme les, les bases de données de Panama Papers, Swiss Leaks, Bahama, Bahama Papers, Paradise Papers, sont, sont vraiment importants important, euh, euh, pour nous. D'où, euh, euh, parfois, euh, l'intérêt d'avoir des, des, des collaborations avec certaines institutions comme ACAG, ANSIR, euh, African euh, Investigative Publishing Collective, des organisations avec lesquelles, bon, moi, je, je les ai citées parce que c'est les organisations avec lesquelles euh, j'ai pu collaborer pour avoir accès à un certain nombre de, de bases de données. Parce que, comme on l'a vu, c'est très compliqué parfois, de, à partir de nos pays, euh, sans avoir euh, des informations préalables, c'est très compliqué de, de partir à la traque des pilleurs. Donc, parfois, il vous faut, euh, genre, une sorte de coup de pouce euh, que vous aurez peut-être trouvé euh, euh, dans une base de données. Et donc, c'est important d'avoir euh, d'avoir des partenariats avec ces genres d'institutions, d'organisations pour avoir accès aux bases de données. Euh, parce que, par exemple, si moi, j'ai pu euh, faire le travail sur le Panama Papers, enfin, sur euh, ce qu'on a appelé chez nous Wasemgate, c'est parce que j'ai pu avoir accès à la base de données de, de Panama Papers. Et puis, il y a il y a aussi, euh, tout à l'heure j'ai dit c'est important d'avoir à ces, à ces genres de bases de données, mais ça ne nous prive pas de chercher des sources au niveau local. Parce que par exemple, lorsque moi j'ai travaillé sur le Panama Papers, euh, 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 l'aspect même qui a, qui a le plus donné, euh, qui a donné davantage d'écho, qui a donné davantage d'écho à mon travail, c'est le fait que j'ai pu, pour la première fois, publier la liste des actionnaires de, 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 de la société sur laquelle j'ai travaillé. Et sur cette liste, figure le nom de plusieurs ministres, le nom du premier ministre qui est en fonction actuellement, et jamais cette liste n'a été rendue publique. Mais cette, cette, ce document, par exemple, je ne l'ai pas eu, euh, euh, je ne l'ai pas eu de, de, de la base de données des Panama Papers. J'ai dû l'avoir au sein de l'entreprise, avec une source locale. C'est-à-dire que c'est pour dire que c'est bon d'avoir accès à ces, à ces bases de données, mais c'est aussi important d'avoir euh, euh, des sources locales, parce qu'elles nous permettent d'avoir des informations utiles ou de vérifier les informations qui, sont, euh, qui figurent au sein de la, de, de, de la base de données. Et donc, euh, là, c'est... Bon, je vais, je vais terminer avec ça pour dire que les, les organisations, bon, comme dans nos pays, j'ai dit tout à l'heure que les rédactions n'ont pas forcément des moyens astronomiques pour faire ce nombre de choses, mais certaines organisations, euh, certaines fondations peuvent euh, jouer le rôle de, 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 de facilitateur euh, en termes de, de collaboration transfrontalière au sujet de ces genres d'investigation. Et donc, les, les, les fondations et autres centres de, de journalistes peuvent travailler, par exemple, à mettre en relation euh, les journalistes pour travailler sur des sujets euh, transfrontaliers, euh, comme ce que j'ai comme ce que ICAG m'a aidé à faire, en mettant en contact avec un journaliste au Ghana. Et, et ces, ces organisations aussi peuvent nous aider à comprendre. Vous savez, lorsqu'on parle, par exemple, de, de flux illicites, combien de journalistes ont la capacité de comprendre ces enjeux Moi, par exemple, j'ai eu la chance de, de, de bénéficier d'une formation sur les, les flux illicites. Même malgré ça, après euh, avoir eu assez à la base de données de Panama Papers, il a fallu qu'on puisse avoir des experts pour nous expliquer à chaque fois que nous avons des thèmes, des technologies techniques, tout ça, il a fallu que nous ayons euh, des experts pour nous expliquer les enjeux de la chose. Donc, les, les, les fondations, par exemple, les fondations, les, les centres de, de promotion de, du journal d'investigation peuvent jouer ce rôle en mettant les rédactions en contact avec des experts 
qui soit capable de nous aider à comprendre un certain nombre de, de choses. Il y a par exemple l'appui juridique aussi. Par exemple, en travaillant sur le, le Panama Papers, euh, il y a l'organisation comme ANSI qui nous a offert l'appui la juridique. Et ça, ça vous évite d'avoir des en tout cas d'éliminer un grand nombre d'ennuis en amont euh, pendant que vous faites le, le, le travail. Et puis il y a l'appui financier aussi qui est important euh, pour la réalisation de, de ces travaux. Parce que euh, Dieu seul sait que si nous n'avons pas assez à certains, à certains financements, ce serait compliqué de réaliser certains, certains, certains investi certaines investigations. Et puis aussi la, 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 coordonnation, la, la coordination, tant pour moi, des publications. C'est-à-dire que par exemple, si les, 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 les dossiers du Panama PPS ont de l'impact, c'est parce que ils sont publiés bien souvent le même jour et donc ça a un écho plus important. C'est aussi important parfois de s'organiser de telle sorte que les dossiers puissent être publiés par exemple le même jour et même éventuellement être repris euh, 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 plusieurs jours après par, par, par d'autres médias, médias. Parce que par exemple, euh, ayant travaillé sur le Panama Papers, j'ai pu remarquer que si euh, l'information avait été publiée uniquement par, euh, par moi qui suis au Togo, ça n'aurait pas eu le même impact que cela a eu euh, parce qu'elle a été repris plus tard par des organisations, par des médias comme Le Monde, RFI, euh, euh, Deutsche Welle, et ainsi de suite. Et merci beaucoup. Euh, voilà, J'espère qu'on aura un débat intéressant euh, maintenant. Merci beaucoup. Kwame, merci beaucoup mon frère. Pardonne-moi. Et... Thank you very much for um, joining us. We were hoping to have some kind of discussion, but as Kwame said, um, we need to um, take this discussion beyond the session and network and form those international relations and um, those, that exchange of ideas that will facilitate our work and make it easier. I um, would like to thank this great panel for um, the work that they have done in preparing for this engagement and um, thank the many um, distinguished journalists who have come through to this um, panel discussion. From my own country, I would like to thank um, the lead um, investigative journalists who are here. Um, my panel, we have um, Peter Louis, um, who wrote The Republic of Gupta about state capture in our country, um, my predecessor, um, Reg Rami, who's written a lot on whether black economic empowerment is a rent seeking scheme or not, and um, colleagues over there, Sam Soul and Stefan, are the great Amabungan. So um, to them, we owe the story of how our country was stolen. Um, we hope that you are going to be um, engaged um, with each other and talk outside these sessions. Thank you very much for indulging me. <laughs>